Hello and welcome. My name is Carol. Today we're going to be covering one of the most important topics in clinical research, the declaration of Helsinki. Let's begin. What everybody, really everybody should know. The declaration of Helsinki was adopted in response to the cruel and inhuman research undertaken in concentration camps and other places during the Nazi regime in Germany. Their study subjects had been forced to take part in trials in which severe suffering and even deliberate killing were accepted. The research undertaken in concentration camps was investigated at the Nuremberg trials in 1945 and 1946 by the victorious Allied forces of World War II. 20 of the 23 defendants were medical doctors and all were accused of having been involved in cruel Nazi human experimentation. Although many defendants were severely punished, it was obvious that the punishment of the people involved would not suffice to prevent such an ethical research from reoccurring. It was necessary to think about ways to stop this from happening again in the future. For the prevention of further ethically unjustifiable research, initially it had to determine what rights patients have while participating in a clinical trial and what ethical standards apply. As a first step, some ethical guidelines were set in many national constitutions. However, these were not manifold enough for the application in clinical practice and left too much room for interpretation on the part of the investigators and scientists involved in the test. In 1964, following a conference in Helsinki, the World Medical Association adopted the declaration named after the meeting place, which was later revised in 1975 2000, 2008, and again in 2013. The problem of research with placebos in the case of diseases, for which a proven standard therapy is also available, remains particularly controversial. Up to the version of the year 2000, this option had been categorically ruled out by the Declaration of Helsinki. However, a fundamental change in this policy was brought about by the clarifying note of 2002. In actual fact, the note was strictly speaking not a clarification, but rather a paradigm shift. It allowed new compounds to be tested and compared with placebos, even if a standard therapy was already available, provided that the research was justifiable on scientific grounds and that no serious or irreversible damage would be inflicted upon the patients. The latest revision of the Declaration of Helsinki remains controversial. There are already several issues that could be offered for a further revision, for example, the rights of trial subjects after the completion of a study. Already before the revision in 2000, Richard Ashcroft, the British professor of biomedical ethics, noted and foresaw that the Declaration of Helsinki will probably always be further revised and will always remain controversial. This assumption seems to be true. However, the value and the advantages of this document should not be underestimated. It raises a claim of international validity about flaws. It's a document from investigators for investigators and is furthermore well known and accessible, has a long tradition and contains considerably more indisputable than controversial topics. Although the Declaration of Helsinki was originally written exclusively for investigators by the World Medical Association, it's also directed at everybody else engaged in clinical research, such as sponsors, monitors, biometricians, study nurses, and etc. The Declaration has only been a non-binding guideline for years, but in the meantime it can be found in many national laws so that any violation of the Declaration is automatically a violation of applicable laws. The Declaration of Helsinki is an abstract document which is divided into three sections. Introduction, Principles for All Medical Research and Additional Principles for Medical Research Combined with Medical Care. In particular, it aims to improve patients' rights and comments on research on disadvantaged or particularly vulnerable populations and on research which is of benefit to an outside agency undertaken on volunteers or patients unable to give informed consent. Altogether, four essential basic statements can be found in the Declaration of Helsinki. First of all, a physician should act in the patient's best interest when providing medical care. 
This involves risk and burdens which might have the effect of weakening the physical and mental condition of the patient. In this context, you should bear in mind though that the term in the interest of a patient refers to the entire patient population. In a placebo control study, for example, the patient treated with placebos does not benefit from participating in the study, but on the contrary, even as a standard therapies will help from him. Secondly, it's the duty of physicians who participate in medical research to protect the life, the health, the dignity, integrity, right to self-determination, privacy and confidentiality of personal information of research subjects. The latter point is very important because amongst other things, it refers to areas such as data protection. Already in the original version of the Declaration of Helsinki, it had been regulated that all people involved in clinical studies must adhere to national data protection regulations respectively applicable to them. Furthermore, this point also refers to the rights of minors. Thus, for example, in some countries, it's required by law that both legal guardians of a child must be informed about the study and must have both signed the declaration of consent. In other countries, this is no mandatory condition. Instead, in many countries, the signature of just one legal guardian is sufficient. And thirdly, a trial should be conducted in compliance with the protocol that has received prior Institutional Review Board, IRB, or Independent Ethics Committee, IEC approval or favorable opinion. Although there are no concrete requirements regarding the extent of a study protocol, in many cases, 200 pages or more are achieved by studies conducted by the industry because independent ethics committees demand detailed information about the sponsors regarding the sample size calculation, treatment study participants after the study, treatment of patients in need of protection. Fourth, freely given informed consent should be obtained from every subject prior to clinical trial participation. This point is very important and is abided to nearly all studies these days. However, as already mentioned, the declaration of Helsinki is very brief and therefore leaves room for interpretation by investigators involved in clinical studies in this respect. Thanks for watching. I hope you learned something today, especially on the importance of the declaration of Helsinki. Until next time, goodbye.